What's good, Josh? Your boy Ross back here again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 best Stone Cold Steve Austin feuds. We did the HBK feuds earlier this week. So we're gonna do Stone Cold Steve Austin feuds, man. This one is going to be a good one, man. Stone Cold is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. And uh, anytime you heard that glass break, you knew somebody was gonna get their ass kicked and there's gonna be a lot of beer all over the place so uh one of the notable feuds i can easily think of of course the brett brett the hitman heart feud uh the feud he had with triple h i thought that was a pretty uh, interesting one he's had some pretty good feuds with you know with different different characters of course the one with the rock that's the noticeable one i think a lot of people gravitate to his feud with the rock and um he's also had some good feuds with the undertaker as well and of course you gotta put vince mcmahon in there the owner of the company his feud with vince mcmahon catapulted him to the stardom that he was in the attitude area and beyond so let's get right into this video appreciate all the love and support and uh let's do this bad boy Stone Cold Steve Austin is one of the biggest stars in wrestling history. This is true. X-rated, unapologetic, Austin captured the zeitgeist of the 90s and became the focal point of the WWE during its hottest period ever, the Attitude Era. Yep. With his no Fs given attitude and love of dropping whoever was near him with a Stone Cold stunner, Austin made a bevy of enemies, from fellow wrestlers to company officials and even entire companies themselves. If the Texas Rattlesnake had a problem with you, you would better be prepared for a fight. Mm -hmm. Of the many great feuds the Bionic Redneck engaged in, some were, of course, better than others. And if you'd like to know which ones, then give me a hell yeah! <laughs> but more importantly, shut up and watch this video. I'm Sam Driver from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the top 10 rivalries of Steve Austin. Join us. Number 10, WWE and WCW. Hmm. Long before he was stone cold, Austin was stunning Steve in yep. WCW, before Eric Bischoff fired him over the phone, that is. Incensed, Austin called his mate Paul Heyman, who allowed him to vent his spleen at WCW <laughs> on ECW Hardcore TV, with Austin ripping everything from Bischoff to Mongo McMichael through WCW as an institution and all of the old codgers who wrestled for them. Austin, of course, had the last laugh joining WWE and becoming the biggest star in history. This is true. But when the invasion happened in late 2001, Austin put aside his hatred of WCW and joined the alliance, leading to a fight against a WWE that no longer appreciated him. This led to some of the best heel work of Austin's mm -hmm. career. And finally, the WWE audience had a reason to actually boo him. As the face of the alliance, Austin held yeah, the... Yeah, it was one of those things where it was hard to make Stone Cold a heel. It took a lot of work, but it was hard to make him a heel because everyone loved him, so... WWE title almost at hostage and would frequently clash with Kurt Angle and The Rock, but more on them later. Eventually, WWE would emerge from the invasion victorious because, well, they were always gonna, weren't they? Yeah. Number nine. It was set up that way. A big part of our mission is to create a space in which culture can be shared. Brian Pillman. When the oh, Hollywood yeah, this is, this was a good feud they had WCW, for a little while. They didn't get a proper breakup feud until both men found themselves in WWE in 1996. Pillman originally rekindled his alliance with Austin upon arriving in Titan Sports, but soon started cozying up with Austin's rival Bret Hart, leading Austin to brutally beat down Pillman and snap his ankle in half with a chair. And that is why we call it Pillmanizing, kids! The two would continue <laughs> feuding as Pillman recovered, with Austin invading the Loose Cannon's home one night in October 1996. Austin had clearly forgotten that the Loose Cannon was, well, a, a loose <laughs> cannon, as Pillman pulled a gun and yeah. attempted to murder Stone Cold in one of the most controversial yeah. segments in wrestling history. Mm -hmm. Pillman would officially join the Hart Foundation and assisted them in their war with Stone Cold, eventually lacing up his boots to fight Austin on Roy's War before the historic In Your House Canadian Stampede. The foundation would emerge victorious from Canadian Stampede, but Austin wasn't done yet with the boys in pink and black. Number eight, Owen Hart. Mm -hmm. 
After Canadian Stampede, Austin shifted his focus to. That's crazy. He was really feuding with the Hearts, man. That that's, oh man, that's crazy, yo. It's it's it shows back then, even like the storytelling with WWE, they knew how to can like increase the feud to the matches that you really wanted, which was Stone Cold versus Bret. Ward Owen Hart, with the two having clashed in the tag division earlier in the year. Owen got the decisive pin on Austin at Canadian Stampede, and that was enough to spur Austin on, with the rattlesnake looking to end Owen's intercontinental title run. The two signed off for a match at SummerSlam 97, but if Austin lost, he'd have to kiss Owen's ass. Unfortunately, though, this match is actually remembered for Owen breaking Austin's mm -hmm. neck, a mistake that nearly ended Austin's career. With Austin on the shelf, Owen bragged about the incident, wearing mm -hmm. an Owen 316 tee, taunting the new Intercontinental and And this is where they would take realism. They weren't afraid to take realism and incorporate it into a storyline, which made it more believable back then. Champion from afar. Austin went on to vacate the title, but he made sure Owen would regain it, interfering on Hart's behalf, letting Owen know that when he was cleared, he'd be coming straight back for him. Several months later, and Austin was back and more popular than ever. Mm -hmm. At Survivor Series, Stone Cold defeated Hart once more for the Intercontinental title, and the bionic redneck took off into the stratosphere. This was also when the Intercontinental Championship was the, the stepping stone for you to be the WWE championship champion. Number seven, Shawn Michaels. This was good Austin too. didn't like the Hart Foundation. Shawn Michaels didn't like the Hart Foundation. Neither liked each other, mm -hmm. but they put their differences to one side for a while to strip Owen Hart and British Bulldog of their tag titles in 1997. With the Hart Foundation dissolved after Montreal, HBK ran virtually unopposed at the top of the WWE totem pole until Austin won the 98 Royal Rumble and set up a title clash with Michaels at mm -hmm. WrestleMania 14. Austin, not known for playing well with others, had stacked the deck in Michaels' favor by making enemies of all of D-Generation X, yep. as well as Iron Mike Tyson. With Which D was one of the most craziest segments ever. Mike Tyson getting into it with Stone Cold, ridiculous. X memorably Crazy. getting the upper hand in the weeks leading up to Mania. But all this did was piss Austin off. He would overcome the odds to sink a stunner and take home the gold, whilst Michaels ate a jab from the baddest man on the planet and retired from the business. Mm -hmm. Could have been worse, though. If HBK didn't do the job, then Undertaker was allegedly waiting by the curtain ready to turn him <laughs> into Hamburg. Yeah, uh, yeah, we saw that in the previous video with uh, um, them talking about HBK's greatest feuds. Yeah, he didn't want a job out to uh well not job out but he did want to drop the title to um to um stone cold and the undertaker was like yo if you don't do it you and me we're gonna really have some issues like we're gonna we're gonna throw down like he was went back then undertaker and i think all at any point the undertaker was always a locker room leader bro so you didn't you didn't want to cross him burger meat and speaking of big mark number six mm -hmm. the undertaker Heading into SummerSlam 98, Taker and Austin were the seven two years biggest old. baby faces in WWE. But mind games from Taker, Kane, Paul Bearer, and seemingly everyone in between made Taker's intentions unclear. After a fantastic main event bout, Austin would leave SummerSlam with the gold still around his waist, but Taker would soon snap and become something close to satanic as he mm -hmm. pursued Austin going into 1999. Taker would try and embalm Austin, normal, before Austin <laughs> buried him alive. Again, completely normal, before summoning his Ministry of Darkness yep. to take over the WWE with the help of a higher power. Normal behavior all around. <laughs> After crucifying yeah, Austin. Yeah, definitely. I remember that segment. I was scared of the Undertaker at this point. I was a little kid. He's like, yo, he's crucifying people. Uh, oh, man. The Ministry of Darkness. I'm, I'm good, bro. Austin, totally 100% normal. Taker would dethrone the Rattlesnake at Over the Edge 1999 before the higher power was revealed to disappointed jeers. Austin wouldn't take those insults lying down and took the title back on the June 28th Raw in one of the highest rated segments in WWE history. Damn. One last battle was slated for Fully Loaded where Austin would again emerge victorious, leaving the corporate ministry in tatters. Number five, 
Kurt Angle. During Austin's hiatus oh, yeah, after nice Rikishi hit him with a car too. for The Rock and <laughs> the people, <laughs> Kurt Angle I rose through. I did it. I did it for The Rock. I did it for you. <laughs> through the ranks of WWE, with his first reign as WWE champion coinciding with Austin's return. The two would circle each other and wear little cowboy hats, but wouldn't engage in a full-on feud until the invasion after Austin hit Angle with a stunner to defect from Team WWE mm -hmm. to the Alliance. Angle wanted Austin's... And that's when you heard some of the best commentary from Jim Ross. Why? Oh, no, I think that was uh, when... Um, I know he turned like he turned heel against The Rock, but it was so it was still some good commentary because boys Jr. sold the shockness of it. Like, it was just it was great, man. This is I miss it, I miss it so dearly. WWE title, but Stone Cold was having none of it. Angle won the WCW title instead, but before he could face off with Austin, the rattlesnake screwed Angle out of Big Goldie, then retained the WWE title at SummerSlam despite Angle winning by DQ. Kurt, however, would finally get his mitts mm -hmm. on the title in front of a hometown Pittsburgh yep. crowd at Unforgiven 2001. But just two weeks later, Austin would regain it, and the two would set their differences aside as Angle joined the alliance. Yeah. But it was all a ruse mm -hmm. because Angle would help The Rock topple Austin and kill the alliance once and for all. Number four, Triple H. By 1999, Triple H was ready for the big time. Yep. But Steve Austin refused to put him over at SummerSlam and dropped the WWE title to transitional champion Mankind instead. When Trips got the belt... Oh, he wow, I didn't know that. That's crazy. Wow. Came back for Austin, beat him at no mercy, and eventually gave Rikishi 20 quid to hit him with a car. <laughs> when Austin returned later, he was understandably fuming and proceeded to beat the absolute snot out of the game at Backlash 2000, allowing The Rock to regain the WWE title. Triple H... And it, it kind of makes sense back then because they cared about their characters, like, value to the fans. So I could see... Stone Cold being like, nah, I'm not going to let you put me over. Oh, I'm not going to put you over like that. We'll just have Mick Foley do it because Mick Foley can take that loss. You, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to let you do it. I, I can see how it was back then because it, it, if you was over, that means you had the most screen time. If you wasn't really that over, you was going to be in the back and catering for the most part. That's just what it was back then. Vowed to end Austin once and for all, and attempted to run him over once more, but Austin picked up Hunter's yep. car with a forklift <laughs> and dropped it on. They were literally trying to commit murder to each other in these storylines. <laughs> it, it was clear that neither man would be satisfied until the other was decimated, so yeah. they signed up for the first ever three stages of Hell Match at No Way Out 2001. Mm -hmm. Triple H squeaked out a win, then a few months later, the two became BFFs yep. and reigned as the two-man power trip. And it just goes to show that real men are able to put vehicular assault behind them and move forward, folks. Number three, Bret Hart. Yep. After I knew this was going to be high on the list. The mood in the WWE started to change. Whereas once the virtuous, heroic Bret Hart had been at the forefront of the company, he was now on the verge of being left behind, a relic of past glories. And he did not like that one bit. Soon, Hart returned from a hiatus, crossed paths with Austin, and it went from 1 to 100 at the drop of a hat. Hart defeated Austin at Survivor Series, but Austin would cheat Hart out of the 1997 Royal Rumble, and then Hart would properly snap. The two were on a collision course for mm -hmm. WrestleMania 13, and a submission match which would change both men's destinies. With Austin weeping blood from his head, Hart locked in the sharpshooter and caused Stone Cold to pass out, achieving the rarest of the rare, a double turn. Yep. It, it doesn't usually happen, but when it does, you, you gotta be able to notice it and do the switch properly. Stone Cold was technically a heel going into this match, Bret Hart was the face, and because Stone Cold didn't give up, blood dripping down his face, though, one of the most iconic images in wrestling history, he didn't give up, he passed out, he never tapped out, people started to cheer, people, I wouldn't say cheer, but they started to recognize, like, yo, this motherfucker didn't tap, this is somebody I want to cheer for, he didn't give up. And Bret Hart wasn't, you know, he was starting to lose to Steve in the overness. And it was starting to have, it was starting to become 
more of a, an acceptable thing to cheer for Steve because he went toe-to-toe with Brett, bleeding from his face, and didn't tap out. People like to see stuff like that. Someone that's that's gritty is gonna give it they all. You not you can beat them bloody and battered, and they're still gonna keep fighting. It was hard not to cheer for the guy. While the match stood as one of the greatest in WWE history. Hart would then reform the Hart Foundation to help him drive Austin out of WWE. Although the foundation would win the feud, Austin was now the man. Yeah. Number two. Oh, the I knew this brand of music and sports is back. I knew The Rock was going to be here. Rock had to be Rock. high on this list. The Rock. It's The Rock. After Rock and Stone Cold. Owen Hart, Intercontinental Champion Austin decided to beat up The Rock a bit before forfeiting the belt and launching it into a river. Of course. <laughs> a year later, and The Rock was the corporate WWE champion, molded in Vince McMahon's image. Mm -hmm. Austin won the 98 Rumble and took on The Rock at WrestleMania 15, and despite corporate shenanigans, he toppled Rock and left with the gold. Two years later, and the situation was the same. A face Rock was champion, and Royal Rumble winner Austin vowed that he needed to beat The Rock mm -hmm. at WrestleMania X7. One of the best WrestleManias of all time. Of course, it was in my home city, Houston, Texas, back in the Astrodrome. One of the best WrestleManias of all time. One of my favorites. Not even a lie to you. We never expected just how Austin would get the job done. Yeah. Though, siding with Vince McMahon to bludgeon The Rock with a chair and beat him at Mania for a second time. Yep. Another two years later, and the two would clash at Mania for a third and final time, with both men wanting to prove who was the greatest superstar of all time. After three rock bottoms, Rock finally beat Stone Cold at Mania it. in what proved to be Steve Austin's final ever match. And number one, Mr. Mc... Knew it. It had to be Mr. McMahon. This is the feud that helped them beat WCW. This feud right here... Stone Cold versus The Boss. Many people could relate to this feud. This is why this worked. Because it related to the everyday working man and woman. You just sometimes wanted to stun your boss. This was that feud that catapulted WWE to the, just at the time WWF, but to the stratosphere. You couldn't, this was the most talked thing everyone talked about every week. Man. The feud that pretty much single-handedly won the Monday Night Wars yep. and turned WWE into the hottest thing on the planet, yep. the importance of Austin versus McMahon cannot be understated. Perfect. The two, quite frankly, hated one another. McMahon hated that Austin wasn't a tie-wearing corporate player the Fed could be proud of, and Austin hated that McMahon was a stuck-up stuffed shirt trying to ruin his buzz. <laughs> The two did everything in their power to destroy one another, mm -hmm. with McMahon constantly stacking the deck against Austin and Stone Cold planting everyone in his way with a Stone Cold stunner. There were countless information. I have a package at the door. Hold on. Got a package from Nike. Been waiting on this package for a while, actually. It was supposed to be here yesterday. But we're not going to talk about that. Back into the video. Moments between the two, the beer bath, bang 316, McMahon in Austin's face, Austin in McMahon's face, and let's not forget the Corvette filled with cement, mm -hmm. or the Zamboni, yep. lots of vehicles and arrests, basically. The two only fought in a handful of sanctioned singles matches, with Austin getting the win in a cage at St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and Vince winning Royal Rumble 1999. Despite moments of alliance, McMahon and Austin are destined to do battle until the end of time. Yeah, man, this this was dope. I love this video, man. Uh, it just brings back memories, man. Stone Cold has some legendary feuds, legendary segments. He is the embodiment of the Attitude Era. He is the embodiment of one of the best eras in wrestling history stone cold will forever be remembered when it comes to wrestling as the guy you know what i'm saying like it, when you think of wrestling you think of stone cold you know what i'm saying you think of the rock you think of the undertaker you think of kurt angle you think of these legendary people you think of triple h hbk you think of these legendary people because without them we wouldn't have the wrestlers we have today Simple as that, man. But comment down below. Let me know. What was your favorite feud that Stone Cold ever had? 
for me, it's going to be, it's going to be The Rock. That's one of my favorite feuds because they were both great on the mic. I mean, fantastic on the mic. You believe both of these guys. You believe what The Rock was saying. You believe what Stone Cold was saying. You believe both of them can win. You didn't know who you wanted to win. This was so dope. So The Rock has to be my favorite feud. That uh, on one, the favorite my favorite feud is Stone Cold versus The Rock. Those those matches, those back and forth promos were fantastic. But I would like to know y'all favorite feud from Stone Cold who he ever feuded with. Appreciate all the love and support. Road to CCK. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See y'all on the next one. Peace.